So first of all, I'd like to take a little bit of a step back uh, and to say something about the title for the whole conference today. Uh, so the conference today is called Immigration to the Nordic Baltic Region, New Challenges for Nation States in the Age of Migration. And I think many of us probably have attended conferences on uh, the consequences of immigration in an age of migration multiple times in the course of 2015 and 2016. But I think it's worthwhile to ask still, are we really in an age of unprecedented migration or unprecedented international migration? Certainly in 2015, as we've heard much about today, this seemed to be very clearly the case in Europe, particularly perhaps in Sweden and in Germany with the asylum flows. But I think still it's important to, to sort of take a step back and look. And actually, this, the fact is that about 3% of the world's population are international migrants. And this percentage has, in fact, remained surprisingly stable, really, for decades. And of course, the numbers have grown dramatically, but that has been very proportionate to the growth in the world's population. So if the numbers of migrants internationally have grown dramatically, that's a reflection of the fact that the world's population has also grown dramatically. So maybe we are in an era of unprecedented uh, international migration if we also accept that we are in an era of unprecedented population growth. But I think we need to keep these things a little bit in perspective, uh, also to be able to have the important discussions that we need to have. So I'll come a little bit back to the question of the nation and the state also in the course of my presentation. But I've been invited to talk about recent migration to Norway, and that's going to be the main focus of the presentation. So I work at the Peace Research Institute uh, in Oslo, uh, and there we have a number of different research topics. You might wonder whether migration is really that connected to research on peace and conflict. Of course, in the case of refugees, it is. We take a broader approach, though, and we focus on research that has to do with migration processes themselves, but also questions of transnational ties, so issues such as sending remittances back to countries of origin, diaspora engagements in peace building, and other types of transnational ties which migrants retain, and also questions increasingly of diversity and of belonging, which I'll also return to today. So these are some of the projects that we have been working uh, on at PRIO, and feel free to find more information online if you like. So the focus at the beginning of my presentation is on recent migration to Norway. Uh, and I've, I've borrowed this uh, graphic from Statistics Norway. They have a very good online page about immigration to Norway where you can find quite a lot of information in English as well if you're interested. The basic presentation here tells you where immigrants to Norway come from. And as you'll see, I hope it's visible more or less at the back, uh, Europe has 53%. So actually most immigrants to Norway come from European countries. And you'll also see that there are proportions of people coming from Asia, not so many from Africa, 12%, North America, 1%, South America, 3%. And in total, there are 221 countries from where immigrants come from to Norway. So it's a quite diverse population. But I think the most sort of striking fact, of course, is that over half of them actually come from other European countries. And when you reflect on what we were hearing about before the break in terms of mediatized debates on immigration, it's quite similar in Norway to what I think it is in many other European countries today. It's not primarily, perhaps, the European migrants we hear about, with perhaps the exception of the Brexit debates in the UK. OK, so how many immigrants are there in Norway? There are 13.8% immigrants in Norway, and those are then the people who are actually born abroad. If you add to that those people who are born in Norway to two foreign-born parents, it's 16.8%. And Statistics Norway uh, sort of as a standard, uses these two figures separately, so they don't add them up. They say 3% are the descendants of immigrants and 13.8% are immigrants, so foreign-born people who live in Norway. So that's, of course, uh, the, the main group. The descendants of immigrants is still quite a small group uh, in Norway. Then there's a point about why immigrants come to Norway, and this, of course, is not... Um, it's one way of presenting that information. So why do immigrants come in Norway? This information is the statistics that are registered about the reason that they are there in terms of what kind of a permit they have in Norway. So if you ask people, they might give you a variety of reasons why they came, for work, for family, maybe both. But this is the types of, of permits that they received when they entered Norway. And in this case, actually, the family migration category is by far the largest. So these are 39% of the immigrants. 
And we know, of course, that family reunification, that consists both of the sort of migrants who come from primarily labor reasons and get permits on those grants, and also those who seek asylum and are granted status either as refugees or have uh, humanitarian grounds and also get that status from there. Also, student migration uh, is increasingly an important factor, and we do have 22% who are immigrants who have received um, permits to stay in Norway as refugees. So it is a quarter about of, of the international migrants in Norway. Now, what I haven't talked about yet is what I'll talk about now. And I think being a social science researcher and personally working mainly with qualitative data, not with numbers, it's always really exciting to be able to use numbers and also to have graphs which are so clear. And I think if you look at the graph here in terms of the 15 largest countries of immigration to Norway, there's one thing that really stands out. There's one immigrant group in Norway which is just so vastly much, much, much larger than any of the other. And I think it's really interesting that in the Norwegian context, in the course of, of 10 years, the Polish group has become the largest immigration group and the Lithuanian the second. And we hear so little about this in the immigration debates in Norway. And these groups are so vastly much bigger than other groups that we hear so much more about. And you might wonder why. Of course, there are reasons for it. Some of those reasons could be related to the fact that they're not really visib visible in the street in the same way. I think that matters a lot. Of course, another fact is the more economic aspect, that these are people who have come to work in Norway, and unless they work and earn their way into having rights in the welfare state, the welfare state doesn't really have any cost with them. And that, of course, both for the state and in the public eye is a very important factor. But even so, I think these numbers really are something that is worth dwelling on a little bit, because this is really what is driving uh, immigration-related change in Norwegian society. And if you ask policymakers and practitioners in schools, in the health services, it is perhaps with Polish parents, with Polish migrants, that they are working with and are most commonly having issues that they have to deal with. Because the simple fact is that these migrants are everywhere and there are so many of them. So what do we know about recent uh, migration to Norway in terms of the Polish migrants? Well, the interesting fact, as with much intra-EU migration, of course, is that uh, we know quite a lot. But there are very many things that we don't know. And it takes time to find out because, of course, with EU mobility, people don't need to register. And we only start to learn about them when they actually decide to settle down. They start to buy houses, have mortgages, and, and come into the population registers of our countries. And with the Polish migrants, we're increasingly seeing that more and more of them are settling down, and they are entering into uh, the population registers in Norway. And that way, Norwegian authorities also learn more about them. So we know, for instance, that Polish migrants are scattered across the whole country which again is, is similar to asylum um, in some ways because they have asylum centers and are also scattered across the country, but is different to some other immigrant groups that have a longer history in Norway and tend to set, settle more in some of the bigger cities. So there are some differences in that sense. We also know that Polish migrants overwhelmingly work in the construction sectors and in the service industries. And many of them work also in through um, uh, contracts in sort of um, agencies that provide them work, usually in the, uh, the construction sector or in the service industries, but also beyond these. But then we don't necessarily know exactly which sec sectors they're in. But we also see that they are slowly moving into other sectors of employment as well. So there's some change going on. And I think that's quite likely to be related to the fact that first, when they came, there's an idea of staying for a short while. And what we found when we're doing research with Polish migrants about their return considerations is that their time frames shift quite rapidly. So they come first to work a bit, maybe to earn money to save a flat, in, save money to buy a flat in Poland, and then they decide, oh, we'll earn some more money, we'll stay a bit longer. And then maybe the family reunites in Norway, and then the children are born, or they start school, and then suddenly return is postponed. And we see that also in the registers, that about seven out of 10 of the people who came five, six, seven years ago are still staying. So slowly, Norwegian authorities are also waking up to the reality that once again, the guest workers turn out to be people who are staying in Norwegian society. And it, it's interesting how in Europe we seem to be relearning these lessons again and again. I think one other fact that I'd like to say something about in relation to the Polish migrants is this, again, graph which I find quite striking and which there is very little discussion about in Norway. So we know that uh, among those who are registered as Polish migrants in Norway, there's a big gap between how many men and how many women there are which is in a way perhaps not so surprising given the fact that we know many work in the construction sector and those are predominantly men. 
But given the fact that we know that Poland has been the top country for family reunification in Norway for the past five, six years, it is still a bit surprising that this gap is not closing. As you can see at the bottom, I have the years there, and we are at 2016, and the ratio, sort of one-third women, two-thirds men, is sort of staying still. Uh, and I think one hypothesis uh, is that still many of the men are, in fact, transnational commuters. And they're actually circulating between Norway and Poland. And these sorts of things, it's very hard to capture in the sorts of statistics that we have about these types of migration. And then you can ask societally, what are the impacts then for integration in Norway, or indeed for the families' lives in Poland, if these men are, you know, for 10 years, going back and forth and circulating? This is becoming a different type of, of migration then, I think. So these are things I hope that we'll be able to say more about from the Norwegian context in due course. But for now, there are many questions that we actually don't have the answers to. So I think mainly highlighting this sort of picture of recent migration to Norway, it's, it's important to say that um, European migration is perhaps what we're not hearing so much about, but what is, what is actually driving migration-related changes in Norway. And the second thing is that descendants of migrants um, are a group that is growing quite rapidly and that among the young population, there are also many who are in the immigrant category because they were born abroad, but they came to Norway as children. So if you look at, at sort of cohorts of age among younger, younger populations in Norway, there are more people in total of an immigrant background than there are in the older generations. Then I'd like to spend a few minutes towards the end to talk about some of the concepts that we sort of, we use and we brush through always. One of these is integration, which we've also talked about earlier. But what is it actually we mean when we talk about integration? So we talk, of course, about skills, training, qualifications that are necessary for employment. On the other hand, we also talk about social issues, cultural issues, perhaps. We often talk about customs, norms, and expectations. We also talk about language. And I think language is perhaps the connection here often. Language connects the issues that are related to employment. You need very often to speak the language to be able to get a job. But at the same time, language is so much more than that. It's an entry point into the culture, into being, becoming part of the society in a different kind of a way. But I think it's useful to sort of take a step back and think about what we mean by integration and, and think of it from three perspectives. So one of those would be state integrationism, which I think is a normative program, a little bit akin to what we might be thinking of when we say multiculturalist ideologies. Those are ideas about how integration should work. Then we have assimilation as another type of a normative program. In many of the Nordic countries, and certainly in Norway, there's been a program of state integrationism, which basically means that you focus on integration in the sense of creating a cohesive whole, creating a functionable whole that should work. And of course, adaptation is a two-way process. So inevitably, people who come in adapt, and then as a result of that, that whole is also adapted in relation to the adaptation processes that are going on. But these are sort of normative ideas about how this should happen. Very often when we talk about integration, however, we talk about it in terms of numbers. We talk about patterns of integration among immigrants. And then very often the burden is laid very clearly on the immigrant population, and we compare them to the non-immigrants. And then we measure how they are performing in relation to the non-immigrant population. So that's one very sort of common way of talking about um, uh, integration as empirical patterns. And then we very seldom question what the link then between the performance in relation to integration then is with these normative ideas. What is it that we're actually talking about? And here I think experiences both of migrants but also of non-migrants in our societies are really important to be able to understand what integration really is. And I think some of the types of public debate that we're having about immigration related issues, they can be explained in many ways by the fact that we don't really distinguish which kinds of integration we're talking about here. Are we acknowledging experiences? Are we just talking about performances in the labor market? Or is there some kind of unspoken ideology underlying that we're not really relating to? And this, I think, then relates back to questions of diversity. And I think in Norway, certainly, there's been this very uh, dominant narrative of a homogeneous past. Uh, and of course, statistically, if you look at numbers of immigrants, uh, immigration to Norway is still a relatively new phenomenon in the sense that the first labor migrants came in the late 60s. Okay, for some, of that, that, for some of us, that is actually before we were born, so maybe that's not so recent anymore. But okay, in a historical perspective, it's still fairly recent. But still, what do we mean with a homogeneous path? In the Norwegian case, certainly we have an indigenous Sami population, which is not unique to Norway, of course. We also have constitutional boundaries that were drawn when the Norwegian constitution was made in 1814. For instance, Jews were banned 
from entry to Norway at that time. That was, of course, thankfully changed subsequently, but still there were some very clear lines drawn in terms of who was included and who was not included, even in that past, which then maybe already then was not so homogeneous since it was necessary, perceived by some, to draw up those lines. And I think in Norway, as in most countries, there are very clear regional differences. There are dialects and there are regional identities where, which really mark differences within this national community, which is a strong national community, but at the same time, it's not homogeneous. So it's interesting then why we're presenting it in this very homogeneous kind of a narrative when we talk about it in relation to immigration. For as many scholars have pointed out, usually there are bigger differences and more diversity within a national community than necessarily across boundaries between different national groups. Just think of things like uh, socioeconomic position or class, for instance. So I think diversity, in a way, is a societal re re reality, and it's not really about immigration. And this really then returns back to the question of what are we asking immigrants to integrate into? Are we asking them to integrate into this homogeneous narrative of the past, which didn't really exist? Or are we asking them to integrate into the society, which is what it is today? And I think in Norway there are some promising signs, notably not really in the, the mediatized debates, but this, um, what I've got on the slide here are actually pictures that are a uh, campaign from the municipality of Oslo uh, about recycling. And they've basically taken a bunch of Oslo-born kids, and they're using this campaign also to show what Oslo is. Oslo is a very diverse society, and they're, they're doing these signs also in different languages to say that maybe these kids are actually speaking different languages at home, but they're also Oslo kids, the Norwegian kids. They also operate in Norway, and they can recycle their garbage in a very Oslo-Norwegian type of a way. So it's a very practical way that policymakers are actually taking the diversity of society and reflecting it back to people to help maybe shape other types of narratives about what society is actually looking like. Okay. Very briefly, I'd just like, like to flag up this idea that perceptions of migration and diversity are very different from realities of migration and diversity. For those interested, I'd recommend looking at Ipsos Mori. They have this um, survey called Perils of Perception, which is very interesting. I won't go into details. Suffice to say that one of the questions, and they have many questions, uh, is about how many uh, Muslims do you think live in your country? And they've asked this in different countries in Europe and in the world beyond. And what they find basically is that there, there is a huge gap between how many Muslims people think there are and how many they are. I think countries in, in Eastern Europe, such as Poland, for instance, have a very, very big divergence there. Also France, interestingly, had a very big divergence. In the Norwegian case, the average guess was 10% of the population are Muslims. The registered number, or the, the number that we're able to assess from the available facts, is 1.8% of the population. So the gap is more than 8% between the, the perceptions and the realities. So then we can ask ourselves, what is it that the policymakers are you know, talking to? Is it people's perceptions or the realities on the ground? And this, I think, is a dilemma for people, and for politicians in particular, when they make public speeches, for instance. I don't think they should pander to perceptions, but I acknowledge that there is a, a dilemma there. The Norwegian state then has implications of immigration, which is just trying to deal with. And they just published this big report um, on integration uh, and confidence levels in the Norwegian society. And they're basically trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. And I think it's really uh, an interesting exercise, and it's hard for them to calculate it, mainly because the predictions that they are trying to make are far into the future, and it is very, very hard to know for sure what's going to happen in the future. But I think basically what they are finding is that it all comes down to the confidence levels in society and to trust. And in order to have more trust in society, we need to have institutions which are fair and which are perceived to be fair. And apart from that, really, there are many question marks in terms of how the economy will develop, who will come to Norway, who will leave Norway, and there are many factors that it's hard for the state to really control. But the ones that they can control is actually to ensure that the institutions are seen to be legitimate and fair, and actually to invest in those uh, as such. But this report, of course, created a lot of debate about what it means to be Norwegian, what an ethnic Norwegian is, and new boundaries were then created in terms of how we think about these questions. So perhaps not necessarily the most um, hopeful debate followed from this, uh, unfortunately. So to conclude then, I think it's interesting to reflect on what the implications of migration and diversity are for the nation state, but to try and really unpack what does it mean for the nation and how we understand the nation and narratives about the nation, what does it mean for the state, and in the context of Norway certainly, for the welfare state and for its economic viability in the future. And here it's important to distinguish between different temporal perspectives, 
The short-term asylum flows of 2015 were an exception. It might happen again, but still we need to have a longer-term perspective as well. And finally, there are political paradoxes here which the media deal with or don't deal with and which politici politicians also have to try to deal with. And I think the main paradox is whose or which common good is it that we want to develop our societies towards? Thank you. Thank you for very good timing. I know you have to rush to, the, to catch a plane, but uh, still, perhaps time for one or two questions? Do we have? Oh, that is one question. But you have to you have to speak to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Lotta. I'm from Finland, the National uh, Association of Local and Regional Authorities. I have a question about the transnordic identity. You were talking about people commuting between also Poland and Norway, and I was wondering, we have a lot of Somali people in Finland, and I realize that you have a lot of uh, Somali people in Norway also, and, and they do marry, and they do move. So has there been any research on this issue? Like, do they, the ones who come, how do they perceive the, their identity? Is it a national identity, or is it more of a Nordic identity? Is there any research on this? Thank you. Thanks, it's a very interesting question. To my knowledge, there isn't any specific comparative Nordic research on that, so I think that's a very good idea. But I know, more anecdotally, I do know that there are a lot of, of people who move around, and in particular between Sweden and Norway. Of course, we have a lot of migration from Sweden anyway, and among those, there are also Somali Swedes. And there's also mobility between the UK and Norway of Somalis in both directions, and there are also transnational families. So there are families scattered across, of course, Sweden, Norway, and the UK. Um, in terms of the identity, I think it's, it's a really, really good question. I think citizenship policy also matters. So in Sweden, you can have dual citizenship. In Norway, you can't. Uh, I wonder whether that might mean something for what kind of citizenships people might choose. And in terms of their identities, I think it's, it's still a bit hard to say because the Somali communities in Norway are still fairly recent. Most of them came only first in the 90s, and there's been a quite steady sort of inflow of people from, with Somali backgrounds since then. So there are very many children and young people so hopefully, maybe in 20, 30 years, we'll, we'll know more. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hello, I'm Russell Snyder, and I have a little bit different question. Um, Norway has been quoted in the newspapers or in articles as being the happiest country in the world this year. And I'm wondering, do you have any idea about the immigrants, how happy they are? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, I guess the short answer is no, not really. I don't think that uh, that measurement sort of distinguished very clearly between you know, immigrants and, and not immigrants. I think what we find uh, in research that actually has been done on, on happiness and immigrants as well is that um, it depends whether you compare them to the people in the country they left from or the, the people in the country they came to. And of course, we have to take into account struggles that immigrants often face in terms of labor market participation, discrimination, and those things. And I think more at an emotional level, there's always this sort of migrant paradox of ambivalence. You don't really belong back in your country of origin anymore, and you don't yet quite belong in your new home. So I think in terms of happiness levels, the sort of technical ways of measuring that, I think, is interesting for migration research to consider. Thank you, and thank you once more for a very interesting presentation. Then.